Hi, good day everyone. I am Vela Clarice Menes and I am here to discuss about the education system and development. Much of the literature and public discussion about education and economic development in general in education and employment in particular revolves around two fundamental economic processes. The first one is the interaction between economically motivated demands and politically responsive supplies and determining how many quality school places are provided, who gets access to these places, and what kind of instruction they receive. And the second one is the important distinction between the social and private benefits of cost of different levels of education and in the implication of this differential for educational investment strategy. So, as you all know, education is a human right, a powerful driver of development, and one of the strongest instruments for reducing poverty and improving health, gender equality, peace, and stability. It delivers large consistent returns in terms of income, and it is the most important factor to ensure equality and inclusion. Youth have also suffered a loss in human capital in terms of both skills and jobs. In many countries, these declines in youth employment were more than twice as large as the declines in adult employment. As a result, this generation of students, and especially the more disadvantaged, may never achieve their full education and earnings potential. How does education system contribute to development? So, it can help to build human capital, which is the technical and social skills of the population. Education can also increase the ability of people to participate in the workforce and to be more productive. It can also help create better jobs and businesses leading to economic development. In addition, education can help to build social capital by creating ties between people and the organization. This can lead to better communication and coordination, which can benefit community development. And now, let us proceed to education industry. So, the first one is the education industry comprises establishments whose primary objective is to provide education. These establishments can be public, non-profit, or for-profit institutions. They include elementary schools, secondary schools, community colleges, universities, and ministries of the Department of Education. Other constitute of the modern education system include chartered schools, online academies, vocational centers, and the corporate educational support services. So elementary school teachers work within the children at the kindergarten level through the sixth level. So secondary teacher instruct students at both junior and senior high school levels. At the college and university level, lecturers and prof professor instruments um, in instruct undergraduate, graduate, and un undergraduate and postgraduate students. In vocational centers, instructors teach students technical skills that have direct application in the job market. The education industry plays a major role in the economy economic development of both developed and developing countries among the many resources that play a part of a growth of a country's economy human capital is perhaps the most important so as you can see the second one is the educational institution contribute in a major way in the development of the resource they are tasked with the providing the resource they have tasks with talent pool for other industries, and this is the critical when competing in a global economy. Education industry also generates large-scale revenues and employment. For instance, the revenue generates from higher education alone in the U.S. is over $400 billion. In addition, about $5.6 trillion a year is spent 
education and training globally if you put into the account the money governments private sectors families and individuals put in education on matters employment education employs about five percent of the global labor force undeniably undeniably education plays a crucial role in the producing poverty and inequality and laying a, a foundation for sustained economic growth. So governments are also expected to develop and implement strategies that promote education and enrollment of students in higher education. High enrollment in higher education can translate into more skilled labor which can provide a positive impact in a country's GDP. Moreover, a bigger number of a enrolled student results in a greater number of job opportunities for educators. However, this is not the case in many developing countries around the world as government falls short of this expectation. Education institution there is struggle to deliver required skill for its workforce. The, uh, this may be attributed to limited sources, few schools, poor infrastructure, poor management, etc. Third, technology is also being integrated into every sector, the education industry. Educators can now use other modes of delivery to teach and communicate with students apart from the classroom. With digital technologies such as live streaming and video conferencing, a student can now earn certificates through online academies. Universities are also offering online courses that are de delivered and complete over the internet. Other players in the educational industry should now embrace digital technologies as this is what will shape the future of education. So for all in all, the future of the education industry is promising. Stakeholders have stated to realize that the one-size-fits-all approach is no longer feasible, that students excel at different things and can be grouped by an intelligence and potential rather than age. The education system is the future will focus on mastery learning where students can learn at their own time and uh, no, pace. Success will, success will be the measure by mastery of key concept rather than passing standardized tests. Fifth is the master learning is the transformation education innovation of our time. At its core, mastery learning enables students to move forward at their own pace of the of the master knowledge skills and dispositions effective implementation at scale will completely change how students learn how teachers teach and how school work it will revolutionize state testing education research and the labor market it will transform how curricula are developed how learning is measured, and how teachers are trained. Social versus private benefits and costs. Typically in developing countries, the social cost of education, the opportunity cost to society as a whole resulting from the need to finance costly educational expansion at higher levels when these limited funds might be more productively used in other sectors in the economy. Increase rapidly as students climb the educational ladder. The private costs of education, those borne by students themselves, increase more slowly or may even decline. So this widening gap between the social and private costs provides an even greater stimulus to the demand for higher education that than it does for education at lower levels. But Educational opportunities can be accommodated to these distortion demands only at full social cost. Oh, let us proceed to the figure 8 private versus social benefits and costs of education and illustration. So, 
as you can see in this figure 8.6, expected private end return and actual private cost are plotted against years of completed schooling. As a school completes more and more years of schooling, expected private returns grow at a much faster rate than private cost for reasons explained earlier to maximize the difference between expected benefits and cost. The and the ano uh, thereby the private rate of return to investment in education, the optimal strategy for a students would be a secure as much schooling as possible. Now consider figure eight point six B where social returns and school costs are plot. Against years of schooling, the social benefit curves rises sharply at first, as you can see, and reflecting the improved levels of productivity of, say, small farmers and the self-employed that results from receipt of a basic education and the attainment of literacy, arithmetic skills, and elementary vocational skills. Thereafter, the marginal social benefits of additional years of schooling rises more slowly and the school returns curve begins to level off. By contrast, the social cost curve shows a slow rate of growth for early years of schooling, which is the basic education. And then, a much more rapid growth for higher levels of education. This rapid increase in the marginal social cost of post-primary education is the result both of the much more expensive capital and recurrent cost of higher education, buildings and equipments, and the fact the uh, much post-primary education in developing countries is heavily subsidized. It follows from figure 8.6b that the optimal strategy from the social viewpoint, the one that maximizes the net social rate of returns to education investment would be one that focuses on providing all students with the least B years of schooling. Beyond B years, Marginal and social costs exceed marginal social benefits, so additional public education investment in new higher level school places will yield a negative net social rate of return and value of B. Such of a 9 years of school would vary according to economic condition and would be controversial but because of difficulties in calculating earnings, gains, and debate over which types of social benefits should be considered. So, in figure 8.6 also illustrates the inherent conflict between optimal private and social investment strategies, a conflict that will continue to exist as long as private and social valuation of investment in education continue to diverge as a student climb the educational ladder with the highest subsidies at the higher levels of education commonly availed by the elites. This is one of the reasons why we must also consider the structure and pattern of that economic growth and its contribution and impl implication. Now, let us proceed to the health measurement and disease burden. The World Health Organization, the key UN agency concerned with global health matters, defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. This approach may put us on a better conceptual foundation but, not, but does not in itself provide a better measures. An alternative measure of health promoted by the WHO is the Disability Adjusted Life Year, DALI. There are doubts about the 
quality of data use in these measures, especially for some of the poorest countries, and the use of DALIs to compare health across con countries uh, is controversial. Premature deaths presented about the two-thirds of loss, the uh, disability accounted for the remaining third. So, however, average average levels can mask great inequality. For example, in some countries, minorities and in indigenous population can have life ex expectancies that are decade or more shorter than the dominant group and their infant mortality rates can be more than triple the national average 45 thus as is the case with income and education the distribution of health among the population not just average is what matter as one might expect the poor are significantly less health than the more affluent health measurement and the definition so health measurement scales are those tools and items used to collect and analyze data regarding health indicators and outcomes to ev evaluate health status of both individuals and population so health status can be measured using pathological and clinical measure and is usually observed by clinicians or measured using instruments types of disease measurement includes signs blood pressure temperature x-ray tumor size symptoms disease specific checklist so this is burden definition the term burden of disease generally describe the total cumulative consequences of a defined disease or range of harmful disease with respect to disability in community these consequences include health social aspects and cost to society the gap between an ideal situation where everyone lives free of disease and disability and the cumulated current health status is defined burden of disease is an indication of the impact of living with illness and injury and dying prematurely it is measured using disability adjusted life years or you dali which is the number of years of healthy life lost due to the death of illness the world health organization has provided a set of detailed guidelines for measuring disease burden at the local or national level in 2004 the health issue leading to the highest yld for both men and women was un unipolar depression in 2010 it was lower back pain according to an article in the lancet published in november 2014 disorders in those aged 60 years old and older presented 23 percent of the total global burden of disease and leading contributors to disease burden in this group in 2014 were cardiovascular disease 30.3%, malignant neoplasm 15.1%, chronic respiratory disease 9.5%, and neurological and mental disorders 6.6%. And now let us proceed to the health challenges faced by developing countries uh, as we all know the the first i uh, know the first problem in our countries is the absolute poverty not only in our countries so absolute poverty poverty plays such a central role in most health problems faced uh, by developing countries that is that has his own designation so when we see absolute poverty, a condition condition where household 
income and insufficient to afford basic basic needs of life like food, shelter, and clothing. So here, the second one is the relative poverty. When households receive 50% less income, that's average median income. So here, absolute poverty is also called extreme poverty. It is also lack of sufficient resources to, to secure basic life necessities including amongst other safe drinking water, food, or sanitation. The poverty line is often calculated on the basis of income, where the income of a person or a family falls below a certain level considered to be a minimum required for a reasonable standard of living. Then, this person or family is considered as poor. So here, when we say absolute poverty, when people do not have enough money or resources to meet their basic human needs, such as lacking food, water, and shelter. Relative poverty, when people don't have enough money or resources to live up to normal, standard in a society often defined or living below the median or midpoint income. So here, malnutrition, many deaths attribute to a proximate cause of disease, particularly among children, have a their root cause malnutrition, which can weaken and Im the immune system. About 800 million people suffer under nourishment and up to 2 billion suffer one or more micronutrient deficiency. So here, malnutrition refers to deficiencies or excesses in nutrient intake, imbalance of essential nutrients, and impairment nutrient utilization. The double burden of malnutrition consists of both undernutrition and, and overweight and obesity as well as diet-related non-communicable disease. Undernutrition manifests in our four broad forms, which is wasting, stunting, under, underweight, and micronutrient deficiencies. Wasting is defined as low weight for height. It often indicates recent and severe weight loss, although it can also persist for a long time. It usually occurs when a person has not had food of adequate quality and quantity of food. So, wasting in children is associated with a higher risk of death. If not treated properly, is stunting is defined as low height for age. It is a result of chronic and recurrent undernutrition, usually associated with poverty, poor maternal health and nutrition, frequent illness and or inappropriate feeding and care in early life. Stunting, stunting prevents children from reaching their physical and cognitive potential. So, underweight is defined as low weight for age, a child who is, who is underweight may be stunted, wasted, or both. So, micronutrient deficiency or lack of vitamins and minerals that are essential for body functions such as producing enzymes, hormones, and other substances needed for growth and development. AIDS. Now, the leading cause of death of working age adults in developing world is unchecked. It may condemn many countries and sub sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa, the hardest hit region, to continue grinding poverty. So, AIDS direct acquired. Immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS is a chronic potential life threatening condition caused by a human 
immunodeficiency virus or yung HIV by damaging by damaging your immune system HIV interfer interferes with your body's ability to fight infection and disease so HIV is a sexually transmitted infection yung STI it can also spread by contact with infected blood and from illicit and injection drug use of sharing needles. It can also be spread from mother to child during pregnancy. So, childbirth or breastfeeding without medication, it may take years before HIV weakens your immune system to the point that you have AIDS. So, sabi daw, there's no cure for HIV or AIDS, but medication can control the infection and prevent progression of the disease. Antiviral treatments for HIV have reduced AIDS death around the world. And international organizations are working to increase the ability of prevention measures and treat treatment in resource poor countries so how hiv spreads so to become infected with hiv infected blood semen or vaginal secretion must enter your body this will happen in several ways the first one is by having sex you may become infected if you have vaginal anal or oral sex with an infected partner whose blood semen or vaginal secretion enter your body the virus can enter your body through the mouth sores or small tears that sometimes develop in the rectum or vagina during sexual activity. And the second one is by sharing needles. So, sharing sharing is contaminated in, injection during parapernalia, needles, and syringe puts you in high risk of HIV and other infectious disease such as hepatitis. And then, the uh, from blood transfusion. In some cases, the virus may be transmitted through blood transfusion. Hospitals and blood banks screen the uh, blood supply for HIV. So this is risk is very small in the U.S. and the other upper middle income countries. The risk may be higher in low income countries that are not able to screen all donated blood during pregnancy so during pregnancy or delivery or through breastfeeding excuse in infected mother can pass the virus on to their babies mother who are hiv positive and get Treatment for the infection during pregnancy can significantly lower the risk to their babies. Malaria. Once in retreat, it's most deadly. A strain is now making in a big comeback, particularly in Africa. It is still kills well over 1 million people each year. 70% of them children under age 5. So, malaria is a serious and sometimes fatal disease caused by a parasite that commonly infected a certain type of mosquito which feeds on humans. People who get malaria are typically very sick with high fever, shaking shields, and flu-like illness. So, how is malaria transmitted? Usually, people get malaria by being bitten by a an infected female or yung ano, anopels mosquito yung female mosquito only anopels, anopels mosquitoes can transmit malaria and they must have been infected through a previous blood meal taken from an infected person when a mosquito bites an infected person a small amount of blood is taken is in which contains microscopic malaria parasites about one week later when the mosquito takes its next blood meal these parasites mix with the mosquito's saliva and are injected into the person being 
bitten. So, because the malaria parasite is found in red blood cells of an infected person, malaria can also be transmitted through blood transfusion, organ transplant, or the sure use of needles and syringe contaminated with blood. So, malaria may also be transmitted from a, a mother to her unborn infant before or during delivery. And tuberculosis or TB currently claims about 2 million lives each year. One third of the world's population is infected with the TB bacteria. Baculus, and each year about 8 million new cases result from his reservoir or infection. New multi drug resistant strain of TB, difficult and expensive to treat, are spreading to TB hot zone in the developing world. So, tuberculosis or TB is a disease caused by germs that are spread from person to person through the air. Tuberculosis usually affects the lungs, but it can also affect other parts of the body, such as brains and the kidneys or the spine. A person with tuberculosis can die if they do not get treatment. So, what are the symptoms of tuberculosis? The general symptoms of tuberculosis disease includes feeling of sickness or weakness, weight loss, fevers, and night sweats. The uh, symptoms of tuberculosis disease of the lungs also include coughing, chest pain, and the coughing up of blood. Symptoms of tuberculosis disease in other parts of the body depend on the area affected. So, how is tuberculosis spread? So, TB germs are put into the air when the person with TB disease of the lungs or throat coughs, sneezes, pigs, or sings. These germs can stay in the air for several hours depending on the environment. Person who breathes in the air containing these TB germs can become infected. This is called latent TB infection. Acute lower respiratory infections, lung infections, primary pneumonia, generally, generally preventable and curable, cause about 20% of all deaths in children under age 5. Lower respiratory infections are common during the colder months. The most common lower respiratory tract infections are bronchitis, pneumonia, and bronchitis. Viruses cause more lower respiratory tract infection, but bacteria can cause some pneumonias which need treatments with anti antibiotics. So, fall and winters are beautiful season when leaves change color, snowfalls, and holiday are celebrated. Falls and winter are also season when lower respiratory tract infections tend to happen. Most of these infections are mild and can be treated at home. Sometimes, these infections require a visit to a doctor, to the doctor or the hospital. It is important to understand the different types of respiratory infection and how they are treated. Here, we will talk about the common, common lower respiratory tract infection, how they are treated and how they are different from upper respiratory infections. Hepatitis B Hepatitis B may now kill as many as 1 million people each year. Hepatitis B is a vaccine-preventable liver infection caused by the hepatitis B virus or B HBV. Hepatitis B is spread when blood, semen, or other body fluids from a person infected with the virus enters the body of someone who is not infected. This can happen through sexual contact, sharing needles, syringe, and other drug injection equipment, or from mother to baby at birth. Not all people newly infected with HBV have symptoms, but for those do that, symptoms can include fatigue for appetite, no, stomach pain, and judice. For many people, hepatitis B is a short-term illness. For others, it can become a long-term chronic infection that can lead to serious, even life-threatening health issues like cirrhosis or 
liver cancer. Risk for chronic infection is related to age at infections. About 90% of infants with hepatitis B go on to develop chronic infection, whereas only 2 to 6% of people who get hepatitis B as adults become chronically infected. The best way to prevent hepatitis B is to get vaccinated. Okay, ascariasis. Ascariasis roundworm parasite affect some 10% of the population of the develop developing world. Possibly as many as 1.2 billion people are parasites. Most commonly infected children under 3 to 8 years old when they put their hands to their mouths after playing in contaminated soil, soil or eat and cook food grown in contaminated or irrigation with unsanitary water. The worst infection caused about 60 thousand deaths per year the uh, overwhelming majority of whom are children so ascariasis is caused by ingesting in digesting those warm eggs this can happen when hands or fingers that have contaminated dirt or them are put in their mouth or by eating vegetable or fruit that have not been carefully peeled washed or cooked people with ascariasis often show no symptoms if symptoms occur they can be light Symptoms include abdominal discomfort or pain. Heavily infection can block the intestines or slow growth in children. Other symptoms such as cough are due to migration of the worms through the body. So ascariasis is treatable with medication prescribed by your healthcare provided. In order to reflect this attributes, health system have a carry out certain function. They build human resources through investment and training. They deliver services, they finance all this activity, they act as they act as the overall stewards, the resource and powers entrusted to them. In focusing on this few universal function of health system, the report provides evidence to assist policymakers as they as they make choices to improve health system performance. Distribution of health in the population it is not sufficient to protect or improve the average health of the population if all the same time inequality worsens or remains high because of gain across this disproportionately or those already enjoying better health the health system is also the responsibility to try to reduce inequalities by patro patro prioritizing action to improve the health of the worst of wherever these inequalities are caused by condition amendable of intervention. So here, the objective of good health is really twofold, best attainable average level goodness and the smallest feasible differences among individuals and group, fairness, a gain in either one of these with no change in the other constitutes an improvement. So in addition, it is direct positive effect of national health standards Basic health is also an effective means to achieve goals of poverty reduction. Although both parents may be employed or self-employed long hours if parents are too weak, unhealthy, and unskilled to the productive enough to support their family, the children have to work. But if the children work, they cannot get the education. They need so they need to grow up. They will have to send their own children to work. That's the bad equilibrium of Child day labor examined earlier in the chapter may extend across generation. As a family uh, is effectively locked in, in a vicious circle of poverty, calculation of benefits of health investment need to keep these long term spillover in mind. An effective government role in the health system is crucial for at least four important reasons. First, health is central to poverty alleviation because people are often uninformed about health a situation compound by compounded by poverty second is a household spent too little on health because they may neglect externally externalities such as literally contagion problems and third the market would invest too little in health infrastructure and research the development and technology transfer to developing countries to due to market due to market failures and fourth Public health programs in developing countries have many proven successes. Government has different roles in different countries, but as the WHO conducted, the careful and responsible management of the well-being of the population stewardship is the very essence of good government. 
the health of people is always a national priority. Government responsibility for it is continuous and permanent. Health, productivity, and policy. In the World Health Organization's definition, a health system is all the activities whose primary purpose is to promote, restore, or maintain health. Health system include the components of public health departments, hospitals, and clinics, and offices and doctors, also the paramedics. Outside this formal system is an informal network used by many poorer citizens, which includes traditional healers who may use somewhat effective herbal remedies or other methods that provide some medical benefits such as acupuncture, but who, who also may employ techniques for which there is no evidence of effectiveness beyond the placebo effect and in some cases could cause harm. It has long been understood that some developing countries' health system are far more effective than others in achieving health goals. Some countries such as China, Sri Lanka, and other regions such as Kerala in India have achieved life, achieved life ex, expect, expectancies of more than 70 years despite their low income status. At the, at the same time, some middle income countries such as South Africa, Gabon, have only been able to achieve significantly lower life, life expectancies despite their much greater resources. The latter countries uh, all have far more inequitable access to healthcare than the China, Sri Lanka, and Kerala. So productivity is the ratio of outputs to inputs, and productivity growth is the growth of the ratio that is, it is shaped in a production function in concept. Health system productivity differs lit little from productivity in any other industry or sector through the economics or medical care may in some respect appear unique. Production in all sector is, is still described by a production function, a relationship between medical care inputs or outputs, Productivity change in medical care is a shift in that medical care production function. Productivity. The uh, devastating effects of poor health on child mortality are clear enough, but, but do poor health condition in developing countries also harm in productivity of adults? The answer appears to be yes. Studies show that healthier people earn higher wages. For example, daily, daily wage rates have been estimated to be about 19% lower among men whose health status makes them likely to lose a day of work per month because of illness than daily wage rates of healthier men. Careful statistical methods have shown that a large part of the effect of health on raising earnings is due to productivity differences. It is not just a reverse casualty that higher wages are caused in part to purchase better health. So, a study in, a, a study in Bangladesh found that the higher productivity of healthier workers allows them to get better paying jobs. In another study, the elimination of deformity from leprosy was estimated to more than triple earnings of workers in India. Next, let us proceed to the Nobel laureate Robert Fohel has found that citizens of developed countries are substantially taller today than they were two centuries ago and has argued that stature is a useful index of the health and general well-being of a population. Increase in height have also been found in developing countries in recent decades as health conditions have in improved. In most cases, rapid increase in average height earlier in the 20th century gave way to a smaller increase in mid-century. If height is an indicator of general health status to the extent that increase by health lead 
to higher productivity, taller people should earn more unless height also proxies other productivity characteristic. John Strauss and Duncan Thomas found that taller men earn more money in Brazil even after controlling from other important determinants of income such as education and experience. Now, let us proceed to the figure 8.12 panel A1 and A2. So, A, 1% increase in height is associated with a 7% increase in wages in that middle income country in the United States. There is also an association but a much taller one with a 1% increase in height associated with 1% increase in wages. Moreover, a shorter individuals are more likely to be unemployed altogether. So, height reflects various benefits achieved early in life. Thus, one is not saying that just the impact of current income or current height. In particular, taller people receive significantly more education than shorter people. So, see figure 8.12. Panels B1 and B2. Note also that these relationships carry over to alternative health measurements such as the body mass index, which reflects short term as well as long term health and nutrition. Strauss and Thomas draw, and draw on these results and a survey of the literature to conclude that health has nutrition to increase productivity with the greatest improvement occurring for those who are initially least educated and poorest. So, the uh, preponderance of the evidence is that health and nutrition do affect employment, productivity, and wages, and very substantially. So, among the poorest of the poor, this finding magnifies the policy priority of health in development. Not only is health a major goal in itself, but also it is a significant impact of income level after the exhaustive review of the literature and its complex statistically the development problem. Strauss and Thomas conclude that the balance of evidence points to be positive effect of elevated nutrient intakes on wages at least among those who are malnourished a healthy population is a prerequisite for successful development the world health organization has carried out the first ever analysis of the world's health system using five performance indicators to measure health system and in 191 member states it finds that france provides the best overall health care followed among major countries by Italy, Spain, Oman, Australia, and Japan. To sum up, education and health are inextricably intertwined. They are both critical to converting this country into one free of severe diseases, extreme poverty, gender injustice, and illiteracy. And possessing these two would help us attain economic development.